Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your goodness. We pray that you would lead us in the life that you have for us. We pray that we would come short of no good thing, but rather we might know the richness of your kingdom and the richness of you and your glory. Pray that you would bless each one who's here. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So, tonight I want to add, what we've done so far is to finish what is really a broad introduction. Uh, we went through the six doctrines explained in Hebrews because it says distinctly these must be mastered and don't go back and redo it and go on to perfection and so I felt well we should uh, we should take a first cut at that and we weren't thorough but I think we were pretty uh, we, inc we included many of the important concepts what I'd like to do tonight is describe the transition that you undergo in order to participate in the growth that's designed for you. Part of the difficulty of modern Christianity is they believe uh, the bare bones and quite well other than they we quarrel with each other. Uh, but these fundamentals are pretty well entrenched and not to be moved. The, the difficulty is that there isn't an appearance that there is some place to go on unto. And that's kind of the theme tonight. I want to be able to show you the notion that when things are when things are in the future and when things are in what is spiritual rather than natural more often than not your very first glimpse at that is um, it's you misunderstand it you don't catch what's there and so i want to go through some examples of that um, I also said, well, let's, let's call this transition to things spiritual. And that's because things natural and things uh, spiritual do not mix. There's an overlap and sometimes one is confused for the other. And when you first come to the Lord, there are many spiritual things that, that are awakened to you. Um, but what I'm proposing is to describe to you other experiences in the Lord that depending on your background, you may, uh, you may know what it needs to be saved. And a denomination like the Lutherans are very strong on that. But they, for example, and it may have changed in more modern history. I'm talking about what I've studied from years ago. The Lutheran church does not believe that being born again is for this life, that you are born again at the resurrection. So that's a reasonable, and you can see the logic of it. But those of us who have been born again realize there is an experience that is beyond being saved. And for many believers, they are born, they are saved and born again at, right at the same time. So they don't have a uh, a mechanism to judge the timing of it. Then, in addition some have been filled with the holy spirit as a distinct experience that you can point to the day and the circumstances how it happened and it, uh, it it brings an enormous change and others don't and some when you ask are you filled with the spirit they're they're just not sure and you hate you hate to push because uh, there's no need to embarrass anyone but somewhere if you haven't been filled with the Spirit, somehow there needs, there needs to be a path forward for you so that this experience that Jesus described, that John the Baptist described, is something that you experience, uh, like on the day of Pentecost. What I'm proposing is that there are other, that there is an, another domain that is even beyond that, and that also Jesus talked about. And so 
what I want to do tonight is to introduce you to what it feels like, what it looks like to examine some of these areas in scripture that are mysterious. They're just, um, what tends to happen is you read past them and you don't notice that it was odd, that what was said was, was not a sequitur, you know, it was, a, it was not a sequitur. It, uh, it doesn't make sense. And so the reason why I'm pointing that out is because as we probe into the future, we're going to examine them and make sense of them, show that this is a call to something that is greater than we have now. So that's, uh, that's the task at hand. It's a little similar to the land of promise. You go from the wilderness, which is dry, hot, into a lush land, milk and honey. And so again, much of the church believes that Jordan represents death. And so it's logical. You know, this life is a wilderness and hard to figure out and you do the best you can. But when you die, then you, then you enter into the land of promise. But we're going to suggest to you that the land of promise is to be inherited here and now. And what I want to do is to act like a spy if I can and bring some grapes back, uh, some evidence that there really is something else that the Lord has prepared you for. And as we have said before, the thing that disqualified Israel from entering in the land was unbelief. They could not believe that God could pull it off. And Joshua and Caleb said, of course he can but the rest of Israel refused it. And the New Testament is plain that in God's view, that refusal to go on is also present in the, in the New Testament, in the present Christian life. And so that's why it's referred to in the New Testament as an example of unbelief. And it says, don't let yourselves fall into that same mistake. I have a, a theory about the grapes. Uh, I haven't read anybody that proves the theory, so I'm, I'm the only keeper of it. <laughs> and that is, it says that the, the one bunch of grapes was so large that it took two men with a pole to carry it. So it occurred to me one day that we have we have something that is called a grape fruit and it's large it's much larger than a grape and i wondered if our calling because why would you call it a grapefruit and i wondered if that wasn't the original size of the grapes so that one bunch of grapes is just you know 100 pounds or just something astonishingly large so uh, on my list of things to look into in the heavenly journey is will be just that. And the Lord may say I'm silly, but I don't know. I wanted to talk about things that are mystical and we are often uncomfortable with that word because as I've mentioned before, some of these things we want to go through, the new age has already been there and they've stolen it from us. And so they've created the vocabulary that's accurate, but they've put it to a twist that is harmful. It's demonic in many ways. Uh, but the word mystical is an adjective and it comes from the noun, that, which is in the Bible, which is mystery. There are mysteries in the scripture. There are, there are secrets that God keeps and his intention is to reveal them to us. The Bible uh, st states and restates that often. The things that are mystical, I'm also adding words like hidden and spiritual, that they are not natural. Things that are ethereal uh, do not occur in the realm of physics. And so the path forward is to engage in things spiritual because the Bible cautions us that the natural mind is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. It's, um, it was ruined by Adam and uh, 
we'll only survive this life and uh, we get an eternal body uh, in the future. So, the structure of what I'm doing heading forward, I want to go through three major categories and I'm likely to do them one at a time rather than mixing them up. The first step in attaining the full development of the inner man is that you are purged from what is unlawful, uh, namely that sin. And so the Bible expresses very strongly that once uh, once you belong to the Lord, you should not be walking in sin any longer. In fact, it says the new man in you, this, this spiritual, uh, cannot sin. It says that in First John, it cannot sin. So the sin that you experience is coming from your first life, the life of Adam. And so there is a explanation and an encouragement and an empowerment of the Lord to help us finish our quarrel with the devil, where he, you know, he, the Bible says he will not have dominion over you. Uh, in Romans, it says, my God will crush Satan under your feet shortly. And so we don't have an expectation of that because it's nowhere near our experience. And if you've tried, you know, there are sins you try to stop, try to stop, and man, you just get disgusted. It's, uh, there's, if you feel like there's no hope, but there is hope and the hope comes from the Lord himself. He is the one that delivers you from sin. You don't, it's not a self-help. Uh, behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world and he takes them away and his blood cleanses. And so if you're not experiencing the blood cleansing in everything, then there's an obstacle and it's usually the enemy. It can be our own opinions and other things natural, but we, we need to work on the, the freedom of, of sin and it needs to be early or else, um, it says, uh, Jesus said, blessed are the pure in heart for they shall see God. If your heart isn't pure, you live in a fog. You, you can't see, you think you can, because we have eyes. And we look around and we have opinions and you know life is pretty interesting and dramatic but it's not it's not the life that the lord is leading us to and so uh, sentencing it and being done with it is not that difficult because if you place yourself in god's will he will lead you in that path and he is the one, it's by his blood, his blood, not ours, his that cleanses. And so then it becomes an experience rather than just simply a doctrine. The second domain we want to talk about is being flooded with light. It's, it's like you wake up into a new world. You, you see things, they've always been in the Bible, but you just have, they have not struck you before. And you find yourself with the ability to, to walk in all virtues. And so it may be useful to segregate difficulties of our behavior between two categories. One is sin that brings death, sin that brings eternal judgment. And we can name a few uh, murder, a murderer has no life, eternal life dwelling in him. Uh, lying, all liars will be cast into the lake of fire. And so the Bible, if, I think it's First John that says, there is a sin unto death and there's a sin not unto death. And so um, you probably are doing quite well concerning sins that are not unto death. I, I teased our group uh, some time ago and I asked, uh, did anyone we were meeting in a church and I asked, did, did anyone rob a 
7-Eleven on their way over. And not a one did. I said, well, have you ever robbed a 7-Eleven? Not one person there ever robbed a 7-Eleven. Hey, <laughs> that's pretty good. <laughs> that's better than I thought it could have been. And it's just interesting that our our society, which is not a Christian society, believes that it's normal not to kill someone. I mean, you, you can make it through life without killing someone. Well, just move that line into uh, the lesser and lesser sins that, uh, that plague us. And so hatred in your heart is serious. Uh, but being impatient is not serious concerning eternal death, but it is a problem. It, it hinders you. And so we want to review uh, what are the virtues that you must maintain. We're going to look at what are the virtues that you must renounce. You must renounce every one of them and flee to the Lord every time it encroaches on your on your day-to-day -day life. And then we want to add to that what virtues, and there are dozens and dozens, and you, you must pay attention to every one of them and very quickly turn to the Lord in any in any instance of failure. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us, forgive us and cleanse us. And it's the testimony of many Christians who use that scripture, they feel forgiven, but they're not cleansed. They're not cleansed. Same old, same old. There I go again. And so I'm proposing to you that what I'm outlining now is the reason why we need instruction so that... Um, we can say yes to the promptings of the Holy Spirit that we didn't recognize was the Holy Spirit. And that will help us to grow. You, you'll find yourself not resisting. And then the final step is union, marriage. It's being joined one, you alone joined with the Lord. And so that also is an experience. And so we want to spend time in each of the three. I'm a little... Don't, don't know what word to use. <laughs> I'll tell you why I'm a little. I went through the scriptures at a first cut and I found 400 scriptures that say we shouldn't sin. So what do I do? You know, it's a dilemma. I'm, I'm tempted to show you every one of them. I don't know. Are you up for it? Are you up for the truth that... Uh, that maybe we've been denying so long. I don't know. I, uh, I know the Lord has mercy and he doesn't want to make it hard on you. But boy, oh boy, sometimes we just need to be scandalized by the Holy Spirit. We need to realize it's like we don't believe we can offend the Lord. Uh, that we can displease the Lord. We, it's, we Somehow we've erased that thinking and so... Uh, so I told my boss a lie today. You know what difference does it make? Well, I don't know. You're under you're under a threat unless it's taken care of. It's you don't want to keep accumulating these things. So we'll see what I feel is the next uh, step. So in union, your heart becomes God's sanctuary, and that's uh, uh, John. 1423, which is probably the pinnacle scripture in this uh, place of redemption, this, this union, the father and the son taking up residence in the individual. When there's union, you are continually in God's presence. For most of us now, it's, it's not random, but it's not we are more or less surprised when the when the Lord moves near. And we'll talk about that tonight some. Uh, so what I'm talking about is being before the Lord constantly as an experience. And then one component is that the virtue of love itself becomes the only virtue in your life. And you, be, you realize by experience that the love of God is at the top and all virtues proceed from it and so 
he, he that loves can't sin, just can't be done. It's the purest of virtues. And so we'll be describing, as we have mentioned before, that faith is properly understood. It's the doctrine of faith is intended to instill in you a hope, a hope that all these things, these marvelous things that I'm talking about, that all these things are really true. And then from that hope uh, springs the love of First uh, Corinthians 13. Faith, hope, and charity, and the greatest is charity. And you'll also experience a life of perpetual prayer. You are always in a conversation with the Lord. Uh, we'll find that it's mostly listening. Uh, it's not intercession. It's not uh, making requests before God, but it is uh, a dialogue. And uh, one of the first things we'll talk about is the skill of being able to listen uh, to the things of the Lord. So let me show you some Bible hints of, uh, of the mystical. So, so what I, I just pick some verses, they're random, it's not thorough, uh, but it's meant to show you when you look at the verse, there's something about it that doesn't make sense. And yet it's the word of God, so it has to be perfect. So in the Psalms it says, David says, I see light in your light. Now that's alien to our experience. When, when it's dark, you have light and you, you can see. But this says God's light can only be seen in light. So wouldn't that be something to actually experience? But it's written there, it's an oddity that if you place it before the Lord, he will help you see a resolution in that so that that scripture becomes a part of you. Uh, taste and see that the Lord is good. The idea of taste, that's, uh, we would rather say no and see, but tasting, see, tasting is, um, it's very hard to describe. I remember someone once said, we know what a banana tastes like, but you can't describe it. We know exactly what a banana tastes like, but try to tell people what it's like. And so when you taste the Lord, sometimes you're just at a loss for words. You know you're tasting him, but the natural man can't manipulate it, can't explain it, can't produce it, can't reproduce it. Another one is quietness as your strength. That's, you would think exercise would be your strength, but being still before the Lord and seeking him in quietness is, uh, according to Isaiah, is what it is that makes you strong. And so the American life is filled with noise, with a din, and it's constant. And uh, one of the main sources is the TV. And so uh, being able to find, and you start slow, being able to find time and a place to be alone with the Lord is essential. We'll talk more about that. Galatians it talks about the hearing of faith. Evidently, faith has ears that don't match what we have. So there's another hearing. We know what hearing is in this world, but there's a hearing of the Lord. There's a hearing of faith. That's a mystical thought. Uh, Jesus talked in John 8 about turning away from judging after the flesh. You judge after the flesh when you call to mind thoughts that were created from your own um, concerns and your own interests and your own knowledge. And then we, we use that to judge. And in Christian circles, you see it on YouTube constantly. It's, it's vicious. Uh, the assault one has on another. And these, these are all judgment after the flesh. Being guided in the truth. I don't know, you can be guided to the grocery store. You can be, you know, the police can guide you away from a traffic jam. 
But being guided in the truth, that implies that truth is a place. It's, uh, it's a place to go. And so the fact that we can't just nail that with a simple explanation shows us that it's mystical. It's something beyond the natural. Uh, John 16 says that the Holy Spirit will, you know, will show you things to come. And being shown things, you know, how does that work? Evidently, the Holy Spirit has the capacity and the desire and the obligation to take things that are unknown and disclose them to us. And so how does he do that? Well, sometimes there'll be something actually acted out in, in, in the world of flesh. And you, you can see, oh man, I, can, uh, I get it now. But other times there's, there's a seeing that is deep inside and, and it creates an understanding without it being confirmed in the natural. Walking in truth. Uh, is truth really a place that you walk? According to the Bible it is. And so we're, we're encouraged to do it. And I guess as you probe it, you can say, well, maybe it's opposite from walking in a lie or walking in darkness. Being not of this world. Well, we can imagine things heavenly. I, I doubt very many of us have experienced Paul's, you know, went to third heaven and you know, the man there, I didn't, did I know, did I actually see him? Did, was, was he really there? You know, I don't know. So there are things that are not of this world that we participate in. Hearing his voice, Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice. And that's, that's a necessity. And it's not a something that can be recorded on a microphone. It's not in the world of molecules, but he has the ability to give us the sense of something he has on his heart and on his mind. And actually there are two gifts of the spirit that align with that. And that's the word of wisdom and the word of knowledge. Word of wisdom is where God gives you information as to what it is that will work, what it is that will really, what it is that that's wise. And a word of knowledge gives us the ability to understand something that God knows that we don't. And so he shares that. So there, there, there needs to be developed in the Christian life and not just among those who are gifted, but I think it's, it's due among all, all individuals to be able to hear his voice. Because he said, my sheep, that's you. <laughs> Being skilled in the word of righteousness, actually in Hebrews five it talks about those who are unskilled in the word of righteousness and you would say why is the word word there why isn't it just skilled in righteousness or unskilled in righteousness so by inserting the word word it creates something that's mysterious something that isn't obvious on the surface uh what it means and so we can accept an invitation to ask the Lord about it and to search the scriptures daily and to see what it is that he'll disclose in these mysteries. The thing about God's mysteries, uh, it says in the Bible that he hides things, but he hides things so that we'll discover them. So, you know, it's kind of, it's, uh, some things are deeply hidden and probably won't be discovered for some time. Melchizedek evidently is one of them, according to Hebrews. I mean, the writer of Hebrews barely mentions it, and then he backs off immediately. He says, well, I can say a lot more, but you guys, you know, can't do it. <laughs> so in church history, over 2000 years, we don't, we haven't heard a Melchizedekian word from the Lord. So I suspect uh, maybe in eternity we'll be uh, better prepared. Spiritual worship, uh, they that worship God must worship him in spirit and in truth. And so we want to talk about worship because what is generally shown today in what's called a worship service is really praise. It's a praise service, uh, singing honor and, uh, to the Lord. Uh, worship is different. And I first was, this was first brought to my attention by a writer uh, I think he was a doctor who wrote on uh, the physical implications of the crucifixion. I can't remember his name right now. But he also wrote a book on worship. And there he said something which 
when I read it, I disagree with it. It's not true. But when I researched it in the scriptures, I found that it was true. There is no connection in the scriptures between worship and music. They are disconnected. Worship is related to your bodily posture. Uh, the servant that found Rebecca leaned on his staff worshiping uh, the God of Israel because he found uh, the wife. Uh, Jesus advises us strengthen the things that remain. Not a lot of clues on how to do that and so We've talked about how the Lord will tell you what to do and maybe even why to do, but often does not tell you the how. And the reason is the how is quite simple. He is the how. And so uh, turning to him and drawing close to him is the beginning of all of these processes. The idea of watching, uh, you can watch spiritually. And it's uh, there's there's another domain and it's filled with life and death and angels and demons and uh, confusion and peace and joy. And we are called to be attentive to it. And the, the disciples were unable to even watch with Jesus uh, in the garden. Have your eyes anointed with eye salve, and that doesn't mean going to the optometrist. There's, there's another eye salve, and so, the Lord says these things to pique in you the interest and the the ability to start pursuing it. And, and so that the Holy Spirit, when he decides that I'm going to reveal this to you, you already had the hook. You already said, well, I, I, was, I saw that and I was interested in it. And it gives you the ability to get closure on it. What I like is the day star rising in your heart. So knowing what the day star is, is one thing and experiencing it rising in our heart is yet another. Being lukewarm is better than being hot or cold. You would think being hot is best, lukewarm is second best and cold is the worst. Not according to Jesus. He would rather have you red hot or ice cold because the ice cold he can work with. He knows what he has. Lukewarmness it's uh man that's it's too slippery for him it's like you know what what do i have here it's a little like, little of this and a little of that uh about lukewarmness there was a was it bill uh, bill bright who had the institute in basic youth conflicts years ago and he had a sermon that i heard one time talking to youth and he said to them, how many here are red hot with the Lord? And so a few raised their hands. And he said, how many of you here are lukewarm? And just about everybody raised their hand. And then he said, can I tell you what Jesus thinks about you? <laughs> so he, he then proceeded to tell them what Jesus thinks about lukewarmness. One that I have a particular affection for is dining with Jesus standing at the door and knocking and if any man open the door i will come into him and dine with him and what we do the reason why we disqualify it from our thinking is we give it to the unsaved it's on it's on our uh evangelical tracks but it's meant it's meant for the one who is growing more deeply in the lord and so uh, being able to hear him knock and being able to open the door is something to look forward to because that is his will that is his purpose for you uh in the book of revelations there was no one worthy to open the seals and and they wept they wept that no man was worthy and that is an odd virtue that you may find that the lord will cultivate cultivate in you and that is a reaction to the grief of what is happening around you, not only naturally, but also spiritually. And so weeping is part of the dimension which is yet ahead of you, where 
the foolishness of the saints or the wickedness of the unbeliever is a deep, it's a deep dagger in the heart. And it's an experience. It's not something you think about, oh yeah, I, I don't like that. But it actually grips you. No one, no one is qualified to open the, the books. And then, and then the lamb comes. And the Bible mentions groaning. Uh, so I asked, I asked the saints, uh, when's the last time you groaned? And so there's spiritual groaning. You may groan because taxes are going up or groan because name it. Uh, but there's another groaning and that's the despair and the anguish of uh, the will of God being thwarted and the state of those who should be contributing to growth in the body of Christ are remiss in that duty. Then another way the Bible discloses this realm is to contrast the spirit versus the flesh. So let's look at those scriptures. Ezekiel 36, 26. A new heart also will I give you, and a new spirit will I put within you, and I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh, and I will give you a heart of flesh. And so the contrast of flesh and spirit and having a heart that is God's sanctuary, having a heart that is spiritually sound, that where there is no fault, and a new spirit, those are contrasts that uh, continue through the, through the Bible. Matthew 26, 41. Watch and pray that you don't enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. And that's one of the, the difficulties because the spiritual side of us is weak and the carnal side of us is strong. The carnal side of us can bully the spiritual side of us. But if you strengthen the spiritual side, then the spiritual side in return will bully the flesh until he's whipped. John 3, 6, that which born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. They are two separate domains. John 6, 63, it is the spirit that makes alive. The flesh profits nothing. And the words that I speak unto you, they are spirit, they are life. And so we need, we need to occupy things of the flesh just for the necessities of life but the true life that is in Christ comes from that which is spiritual and not from things natural. Romans 8, 1. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus who don't walk after the flesh, but walk after the spirit. So the distinction of not being under condemnation is the skill of walking after the spirit. Romans 8, 4 that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. Romans 8, 5. For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh. And you can check yourself. Where do you spend your mental energy? Where does it go? What are you interested in? What attracts you? You know, something comes up on TV and it, and it has you. If you mind the things of the flesh, then you are after the flesh. But they that are after the spirit will mind the things of the spirit. Romans 8, 13. If you live after the flesh, you will die. There you go, John. That's eternal death. That's not, everybody dies. Uh, fleshly living is 100% contrary to the life we have in Christ. But if you through the spirit put the death of deeds of the body, see, that's the purging. That's the getting rid of the, of the offenses against God. If you through the, and it's through the spirit. Remember, Jesus said the Holy Spirit reproves the world of sin. If you through the spirit put the death of deeds of the body, and that's an expectation, then you'll live. So this is life and death. Some more scriptures. 2 Corinthians 7, 1. Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, and you can go back in that chapter and read them, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. 
That is a present truth. That is something that the Lord is saying to the churches today. Galatians 3.3 3. Are you so foolish, having begun in the Spirit? Are you now made perfect by the flesh? And the answer is no. Galatians 5.16 This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you will not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. That's a promise. If you walk in the Spirit, the flesh has nothing to say. Nothing. It cannot act. It doesn't have you. And you won't fulfill, you won't fulfill it. You won't do it what it demands. You'll hear its demands. You may even feel the demands. And, you know, sometimes the enemy uses kind of like an urge, just kind of pushes. Uh, but you won't do it if you're walking in the Spirit. So walking in the Spirit is an essential skill. And we need to learn it. The next verse says, For the flesh lusts against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary, the one to another, so that you cannot do the things that you would. So that's why this battle simply has to be won. Win the battle, and then you will be able to do the things that you would. That's a promise. Galatians 6, 8. For he that sows to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. But he that sows to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap everlasting life. There's another reference, John. Philippians 3.3 3. For we are the circumcision which worship God in the Spirit and rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. When you begin to distinguish between flesh and spirit, you'll realize your betrayals are coming from your flesh. And it becomes an enemy. I hate it when I do that. I hate it when I say that. And you really do. And so you lose your confidence in the flesh because every time you yield to it, it just ruins the circumstances. First Peter 4, 6. For this cause was the gospel preached also unto them that are dead, that they might be judged according to men in the flesh, not, I'm sorry, that, that they might be judged according to men in the flesh, but live according to God in the spirit. And so that's another distinguishing. You can, God will judge the flesh, and that is an assistance to help you live according to God uh, in the spirit. Another virtue that's essential is the one of seeking. Psalms 14.2 The Lord looked down from heaven upon the children of men to see if there were any that did understand and seek God. And so maybe yes, maybe no. He's looking to see who is seeking him. And that's one of the initial steps that we take as we pursue this. We need to seek the Lord. We need to go after him. Psalm 78, 8. This is the, uh, the Lord. I'm sorry. This is David talking to the Lord. When you said, seek my face, my heart said unto you, thy face, Lord, will I seek. Psalms 95, 7. For he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. Today, if you will hear his voice, and the very next verse, uh, which is also quoted in uh, Hebrews, is that, you know, don't, don't let this happen. Hearing, hearing his call to you is an essential part in your responding to him. Um, the Christian life is not a push. You don't push your way into the things that are heavenly. But what you do, you listen to the Lord and he will pull you and he'll pull you at the right way and the right strength and the right path. He doesn't exceed the, the parameters of your, <laughs> uh, you know, whether you stay oriented or discouraged or anything. He's very careful in that. He will not take you beyond your measure. Psalms 119.2 Blessed are they that keep his testimonies and seek him with a whole heart. You can be half-hearted. So decide tonight you're going to seek him with your whole heart. 145, 18. The Lord is near unto all them that call upon him, 
to all that call upon him in truth. One of the major ingredients that we'll be outlining for you is prayer. Isaiah 45, 19. I have not spoken in secret in a dark place in the earth. I said not unto the seed of Jacob, seek me ye in vain. I, the Lord, speak righteousness. I declare things that are right. He says, I'm not, I'm not playing around on the perimeter and teasing you. You know, when I, I'm not, when I say seek me, it's, it's not a vain thing to do that. And by that, he's confirming that it's essential. Isaiah 55, 6. Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. That implies that you have an ability to sense when the Lord is near. There's a time when he's near, there's a time when he's not. That skill needs to be developed so that if he draws near, you put down what you're doing. You don't say, Lord, you know, I want to, I want to finish this movie. Uh, you drop what you're doing. You seek him while he may be found, which implies there are times you can't find him. It's just, it's not, and it's not part of the design and being able to tell the difference between those times is important because the Lord will absent himself on the occasions where he's he's he wants to allure you to go even deeper and um, and especially if you know in the Song of Solomon there's a certain level of insincerity that enters into the wife and so he leaves he leaves town. <laughs> uh, he withdraws. And the purpose of that is that there kind of is a panic. Where, where are you, Lord? And so he does it on purpose for, with the intent not to harm or to embarrass you or to disgrace you, but to say, I'm the one that you're searching for. Why, why are you spending time in these other things, these things that I don't approve of? Jeremiah 29, 19. Then... You shall call upon me, and you shall go and pray unto me, and I will listen to you. 29.13 And you will seek me and find me when you search me with all your heart. So that's a condition you may not have broached yet. The ability to see the half-heartedness. The, the feeble effort that we make. We, we, we give a token effort, assuming that, you know, this will satisfy him. But what I'm going to urge you to is to go for broke. Put your hand to the plow, don't look back, and press, press, press. The kingdom suffers violence, and the violence take it by force. Press. Press your issues with the Lord. Use your whole heart. Zephaniah 2, 3. Seek you the Lord, all ye meek of the earth, which have wrought his judgment. Seek righteousness. Seek meekness. It may be you shall be hid in the day of the Lord's anger. And notice how he puts that little twist of doubt you know, sometimes I think we're just too firm in what we believe. Oh, he has to do this. And, you know, this is what the Bible says. And, it, you know, it's, it's like you're talking to a person. <laughs> he's, not, he's not a set of principles. And so, uh, so work his judgment, seek righteousness, seek meekness. And it could work for you. You know, the prospect's pretty good that, uh, that you'll be hidden the day of the Lord's anger. Second John 1 8. This is one of my favorites. I I kept a card with this verse on it in my desk drawer, my top desk drawer at work. So it was the first thing I would see every day when I would open the drawer. Look to yourselves that we don't lose those things that we have wrought, but that we receive a full reward. You can come out second best. You can fail of the mercy of God. And so 
you have to pay attention to yourself. That's really you look to yourself. You have to search your, you know, your heart goes in it or all the issues of life. And so there are things that you have already worked before the Lord and you don't want to lose them because they, they are accumulating as a reward for you. And so if you don't look to yourselves, then you'll lose the things that you've worked and you won't receive a full reward. I want you to receive a full reward, nothing lacking, complete, total, more than we could ask or think. One other difficulty in things spiritual is that uh, to the flesh, they just simply appear impossible. Nah, I, I, come on, that can't be. So I have a list of uh, things that you got to work through. Eventually, the Holy Spirit will lead you through these. Here's a dandy. Whatever you ask, he will give you. Yeah, right. Yeah, I've asked for a bunch of things and it never happened. So you got to realize there's a reason why. See, scriptures are not operative by fiat. God says it, therefore it's true. And that's, that's one of our common, it's true when it's true of you. It's true when your relationship is right. It's, uh, and so my proposal to you, that if you are living a wholesome spiritual life, you can ask what you will, and he will give it to you. Because it's in the Bible, even though it looks impossible. Uh, ask anything according to his will in first John. Another must pray without ceasing. I'm going to introduce you to the thought that continual prayer, being able to pray at all times in all places in all manner is a skill that is necessary and easily doable. And it's, it's been written about over the centuries very thoroughly. And so it's because we we suppose that, you know, it's, it's like, I got to go to work. You know, how can I pray when, and work at the same time? Well, you can, you can't in the natural, but you can when that prayer is in the spirit. And he spoke a parable unto them to this end that men ought always to pray and not to faint. So it's the same, uh, same idea, two different verses. Another is joy unspeakable, full of glory. I have so much joy, I can't even, can't even tell you about it. Yeah, right. So it seems impossible. And a correlate to that, that uh, Jesus says in John 15, that your joy may be full. Well, so how come? How come I don't have it? How come I don't get it? Well, it's because you, you probably grasp it. You've probably maybe even tasted it from time to time. Maybe you've gotten some grapes back from the land, but enter into the land and you'll see that these are fulfilled. In John 16, Jesus says, I will show you the father plainly. And so how, how many see the father plainly It's a promise, but it appears, it appears just something. No, it's just not going to happen. I'm just not. I'm just not, it'll never happen to me. But that is Jesus' promise to you. It's a commitment. But that commitment is fulfilled when you are at the place that you're ready to be shown the Father. That they may be made perfect in one. Jesus' prayer in the, in, in the garden seems impossible right now. I know I harp on 20,000 denominations, but... So when do we become one? Is it when we're 10,000 denominations? 5,000? 2,000? Is 1,000? Are we made perfect in one? I'm teasing you because I hardly think so. <laughs> uh, and the, uh, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not, shall not want. And so it's like, uh, I'm always a day late and a dollar short. So I would like this to be true of me. Well, these are, these are the, this is the milk and the honey. And these words are true. You're not being teased. It's just, we've, we've stopped too quickly. Oh, here's one. Unless you hate your father and your mother. And of course, uh, during the hippie movement, that was used by cults very violently against our youth. And look what Jesus said. You're supposed to hate your father and mother. 
But when you see what that means spiritually, you'll agree with it. But we can't see it spiritually. We see it naturally. So we, so we recoil. It's impossible for a rich man to enter the kingdom. Well, it, uh, it's as hard as getting a camel to go through an eye of a needle. That's what Jesus said. And the disciples said, it's impossible. And he says, oh, check that. With man, it's impossible. With God, it is not impossible. I want to show you some misunderstandings. I'm going through what is it that disconnects. And so these are examples in the scriptures where the person didn't get it. It was right there, but they didn't get it. The first is when Lazarus was sick and he died. And Jesus said, he sleeps, talking about the sleep of death. But the disciples, who are very wise, said, oh, it's good that he's getting some sleep. I mean, that that does him good. I just hope he gets, you know, a good 12 hours. And, and, the, and then so Jesus had to say plainly, no, 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 he is dead. So, so sometimes the Lord communicates something and we just don't get it. We don't get it. And it kind of takes a dialogue to get through our knucklehead that's not what he meant they were on a trip one time and jesus said beware of the leaven of the pharisees and they said we forgot to who who forgot to bring the bread so it's a misreading it's a misunderstanding it's he said I was, that's not what i'm talking about there's a lot of that in the scriptures that are just easy to misunderstand Jesus said to Peter, do you love me more than these? And I believe that these are the fish because they had just gone through the experience of catching a lot of fish. And so he's asking a double question. Do you love me more than the fish? It's just not, do you love me? Do you love me more than the fish? And so kind of, in, if I stylize the, uh, the Greek from John 21, 15, do you agapeo me more than these? And Peter says, yes, I phileo, I, I love you with brotherly love. That's not what Jesus says. Do you, do you love me with divine love? Is it, is it the highest love possible? So, so he drops it down in two places. One is he ignores the more than these and he ignores the kind of love that Jesus is talking about. So Jesus says it the second time. This time he leaves off the fish. Do you agapeo me? And Peter says, yes, I phileo you. <laughs> uh, so then Jesus drops it down one more time. <laughs> and the next verse he says, do you phileo me? And Peter goes, I've been telling you all along, I feel like I'm you. So, um, so you wonder how much misunderstanding there was, but it, but there there is a disconnect, and that's that's what is uh, uh, the point here is that sometimes the Lord can encounter you with uh, a question or information or a sense of duty or purpose, and it just is it's not what we want. And so we fish for something that's uh, lower. We're willing to accept the lower. And then I want to cover some distinctions. By that I mean, what is it that makes two situations different? What is it that makes two different people, people, two people different? So we, there's some examples that occurred to me. One is Mary and Martha, and we talked about early. Mary chooses the better part which is essential. Jesus said it's the one thing necessary, a very unusual way to put it. Is he didn't say, uh, you know, he's, she's in the ballpark and she's getting there. It's the one thing necessary. And that notion of, the, of being the one thing, what you're being invited to as you continue on in the Lord is to sit at the feet of Jesus not to learn lessons and exercise yourself in ministry, but to sit at his feet and learn from him. Learn of me, he said. Uh, you, you shall find rest unto your soul. Then when Lazarus died, 
uh, it's Martha that rushes outside to meet Jesus. Remember, he, he waited. You know, he waited four days, uh, which means if Lazarus was raised on the third day, it would be a picture of the resurrection. But since it's the fourth day, fourth, four is the number of ministry in the scriptures. So the emphasis here is the ministry of his being raised from the dead. Remember, Jesus told others to unravel him. That's a picture, a picture of ministry. So Mar Martha, oh, Jesus is here and here I go. Uh, but but uh, Mary does not. Mary waits in the house and she waits to be called. And then Jesus sends word, I want to see Mary. So then she responds. In anointing his body, that same Mary, Mary was first to anoint him. And then Nicodemus anointed him. So the Lord has a way of positioning you with an advantage you didn't ask for it but it's it's due because you are honoring him with your best you're pursuing the best you're not doing it Nicodemus is doing it more officially and that's okay it needed to be done he was fulfilling the law but Mary got the job done first and then at the tomb Peter and John are kind of competing and they hear that Jesus is raised and so they make a mad dash to the tomb and John outruns Peter, which is a little odd. You would think Peter would outrun John, but, and then what happens when they, when they get there, John stops at the entrance and looks, but Peter goes in first, you know, Peter is, uh, Let's get this done. You know, I'm going to find out what's John is, is the picture of the more spiritual between the two. The, the gospel of John is, is a very, uh, very remarkable in things of the spirit. Matthew, Mark, and Luke are by the scholars are called the synoptic gospels and they do not know what to do with John because it doesn't follow the same pattern at all. What I propose to you, the gospel of John is, is at a, at a higher plane than the other three. So John wants to see, He's, uh, he wants to know the truth. Uh, and of course he sees it and then he believes it. The tomb is empty. Mary Magdalene on the other hand, when she goes to the tomb, she sees angels. One at the head and one at the foot. But Peter and John didn't see any angels. See, there's a grace there, there's something that the Lord planned for her. And I think it's because of her honoring him, uh, not only by anointing him, but um, by waiting on him to call. And so uh, when you are more engaged in things spiritual, more engaged, you, experienced, you experience more things that are spiritual. So angels are spiritual. And so she sees them, the others don't. She's also the first to see Jesus. Of all the people to meet Jesus when he's raised from the dead, it's Mary Magdalene. And she is distraught and evidently crying because she sees Jesus and she doesn't recognize him. She supposed uh, he was the gardener. And Jesus speaks the most marvelous word that you can hear. He says to her, Mary. And that's all it took. She now knows who it is. And so she, she runs and grips him. So she's the first to see Jesus. And it's not Peter. Wouldn't it have been something if Jesus showed himself to Peter first. You can imagine. Uh, it wouldn't be three tabernacles. It would be 144 tabernacles, 12 by 12. No. Thomas, others saw Jesus. He wasn't there. They tell him about it, and he doesn't believe it. He does not believe those who saw. And so one of the dramas is unbelief of just not someone will narrate something that is spiritual, it's vibrant, it's alive, 
And we say, nah, I don't, I don't think so. Unless then he gives us condition, unless I put my fists in his side and so forth. And which Jesus does, that shows this merciful sign. Now, when they go fishing after the resurrection, um, John is the first one to see that it's the Lord on the beach. Remember he said, throw the dead on the other side. So they know something miraculous has happened. And Peter says it's the Lord, the first one to, re the first one to see. But it's Peter that takes the action. Now he's sitting there without any clothes on, the Bible says. And so he puts on a cloak and he dives into the water and swims to shore, takes action. So, uh, and they caught 153 great fish. The number 153 occurs nowhere in the scripture except here. And so what could it possibly mean? It's an odd number. It's where does it fit? The best I could do, it's 12 times 12 plus 3 times 3. Uh, or is it 9 plus 9? 9 times 9, I don't remember. But 153 numbers in the Bible have great significance. But here's a, it's, it sticks out like a sore thumb. What's the Lord communicating? And so we don't know. We don't know. We haven't somehow, there is yet waiting for us a procedure to dig down and and make that discovery it hasn't happened yet i've i've looked at the commentators it was a number of years ago maybe i should try again maybe they maybe somebody figured it out and of course the marvel was the net was not broken the inference in the scripture is that it really should have been broken there's just too many fish so Jesus said, when you are young, this is a distinction. When you are young, you go where you wish. But when you are old, you are carried where you do not want to go. And so one of the adventures of proceeding through this transition is that you, you'll feel the tug of war with your own wishes, your own desires, your own wants and they will be denied by the Lord little by little. It's, it's a gradual process, but you realize that I can't, I can't do what I want anymore. <laughs> it's so, I'm more subject to what's happening around me. And that's a good and healthy place to be because uh, the servant of the Lord must not strive. And that's a commandment. And so uh, sometimes when others move us and prevent us, Sometimes that's actually a good thing. It spares us from grief. Uh, Peter says to the Lord, what shall this man do? I think he's pointing to John. And the Lord makes a very stark response. I mean, it's like, wow, where'd this come from? He says, basically, it's none of your business. Follow me. You follow me. And so one of the adventures of the Christian life as you grow is that the Lord will pull you back from the need to correct others and the need to control and the need to get things done, you know, just, uh, just right. And realize that each one of us is a servant of the Lord. And unless you have a responsibility to act, it's usually best, it's usually best not to. I wanted to take a snapshot of what are some essential ingredients in the early church. And it's just a snapshot, it's just, it's not profound. And they continued stead, steadfastly in a couple of virtues. They continued in the apostles doctrine. We have to follow what it is that the Lord is teaching us. They continued steadfastly in fellowship. And I think in recent seasons, we've, we're being denied that somewhat. In the breaking of bread, and I think that is simultaneously having a meal together, or uh, it also includes communion, I believe, and in prayers. And so that is a four point attribute of the church. And so I believe 
what is coming eventually will be a reformation of the church where if these are the key components it will draw us together if we are all steadfastly in the apostles doctrine where will there be a, uh, a quarrel and fear came upon every soul uh, the fear of the lord needs to be re-established in the modern church and then finally i wanted to go through some scriptures in the book of revelation that uh talk about uh, the details of of marriage marrying the lamb and uh, they they speak for themselves let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him for the marriage of the lamb has come and the wife has made herself ready now that's a duty that's a duty we the wife has to make herself she has to make herself ready she has to give herself to the processes that are proper for her for the wedding and so for us that's out of our out of our knowledge i mean we we're supposed to prepare ourselves you know it's not even thinkable we we can't relate to it but it i believe it's essential and eventually the lord's going to have to help us through so that we are successful that we perform this duty with joy and with uh, complete uh fulfillment and there came unto me one of the seven angels which had the seven vials full of the seven last plagues and talked with me saying come here i will show you the bride the lamb's wife and he carried me away in the spirit see that in the spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me that great city the holy jerusalem descending from god and that one scripture tells us that whatever is in heaven now, whatever is being built, whatever is being fashioned, whatever is our inheritance, it descends out of heaven from God. It has the glory of God and her light is like stones most precious, even like a jasper stone, clear as crystal. And the nations of them which are saved, there, John, in our discussion, you know, that's a, that's a category. The nations of them that shall save shall walk in the light of this holy Jerusalem. And the kings of the earth, that tells us that, yes, it's the earth, do bring their glory and their honor unto it. And the gates of hell, and the gates, I'm sorry, and the gates of it shall not be shut at all by day, for there shall be no night there, there, no, uh, no schedule, open at eight. No, nope. it's, you can gain access to the throne anytime. And, and the gates aren't even ever closed. And they, meaning the kings and the nations shall bring the glory and honor of the nations unto it. And so, uh, these nations represent the myriad of those whom the Lord has deemed properly prepared for eternal life. And so I caution trying to parse that too carefully. Who are they? What did they have to do in order to be saved? Uh, I don't like doing that. Jesus is the savior and he can save anybody he wants for any reason he wants. He's the Lord. And so we're more harsh. We, we, oh no, you've got to fit this category. Uh, don't do that because it'll, it evidently will be an embarrassment to us. Well, like Jesus said, when others enter in and you don't, when, when others will sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and you're thrust out, uh, it's, that's not a pretty picture. And behold, I come quickly. And my reward is with me. Remember, we mentioned reward. To give every man according as his work shall be. Blessed are they who do his commandments. And we'll talk about we'll talk some about the commandments of God because right now the church is not good at keeping God's commandments. And why do that? That they might have right to the tree of life. The tree of life is back. We, last we saw it was Eden, and, and this. 
uh, seraph uh, guarding it, that they may enter through the gates into the city. For outside are dogs and sorcerers and whoremongers and murderers and idolaters and whoever loves and makes a lie. So there's a good list of lethal sins, sins that bring total death. I wonder what it means to be a dog. Hmm. Sorcery. So. And I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify unto you these things in the churches. I am the root and offspring of David and the bright and morning star. Remember the day star rises in our heart? That's like, hint, hint, same thing. You know, connect the two, please. And the spirit and the bride say come. And the word come there is plural. So it's not a, a plea to the Lord to come, but it's a plea. You all come, come. And that's my word to you. Come, come to the Lord. Return to your first love. Re regain, you know, there's the barnacles, you know, a ship sits in the water and the barnacles form and the ship can't perform. And, and there comes a point when you realize, you know, I'm losing my fervor and I want it back. And so there's only one place you go. You can go to renew your fervor. Man can't help you, but the Lord can. And so the spirit of the bride say, come and let him hears, let him that hears say, come, let him that is a thirst come and whosoever will let him take the water of life freely. That's his promise. And that's what we are heading toward being able to take the water of life completely. For I testify unto every man that hears the words of the prophecy of this book. Now here's a judgment. And I, I wish the people who wrote books would pay attention to it. If any man shall add unto these things, add to the book of Revelation, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. That's a harsh judgment. Leave it alone. Leave the book of Revelation alone. Just let it, let it speak. The book as designed is holy and it's a revelation. And on the other hand, if any man shall take away from the words of this book of prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life, out of the holy city and from the things which are written in the book. So that is a harsh judgment on the book of Revelations. And there's some possibility that since this is the end of the Bible, that it also applies to all scriptures. And so when we get so, I don't know, firm about what we believe and what has to be true, just, just be careful. Just say things like, you know, it, it could be, or, you know, I thought maybe it like be this, but uh, the other is uh, perilous. So, are there any questions or comments? Uh, Paul, with you, the skill of walking in the spirit, could you get a little bit more specific about that? Well, do you mean as far as how to? Yes. Well, because I, think, I think I'm doing it, but I, maybe I'm not. <laughs> Well, the, what's, your, what's your description? Not fulfilling the desires of the flesh. That's the Bible definition. Part of the deceit of the old man is to trick you into believing you're further along than you are. If that doesn't work, then he does the opposite. And that is to make you believe you're worse than you really are. You know, poor me, there I go again. Um, so 
one of the things that starts to characterize that you're walking in the spirit is a sense of it's uh, what do you say it's regret it's shame your heart is smitten when you do something that isn't God's will you're smitten because he's your love and, and you can't just kind of toss it off it really uh, we're, we're going to talk about repentance and the grief of repentance because with, with without that, we have to change our mind about what we think we are and how we're and how well we're doing, and so that can that's revealed by the Lord when when you put your hand at the plow and you say, "Lord, I want this. I want you. you know, the, the rest I know will keep, but I want you." Then He begins to sort through everything that's an obstacle. So we succeed until we fail, and it's by design. The Lord, the Lord will take you through an experience where you discover something about yourself that was unknown. Uh, and so, what what we're going to discuss in the future is what what does a believer's behavior look like, and maybe cite. Uh, from those in history that have experienced it. It's it's a very precious um, You almost don't want to touch it. It's it's holy. It's holy Okay, well, let's pray and then we can hang out as long as you want that's not a problem to me So let's look to the Lord Lord Jesus, we thank you for your goodness. We pray that you become our soul affection we want to inherit you and we pray that anything that interferes with that will just bring the your reproach and so that we will gladly release anything we're clutching it'll be our joy to release anything we are clutching whether it be people or circumstances we thank you for each one who's attended tonight we pray that your blessing be upon them we ask in jesus name amen mm -hmm.